Okay. We'll say something interesting. Oh, well, I can <laughs> do it now. Okay. I brought some. Uh, I brought some books along. Oh, you guys have. Oh, great. There should be enough for one for each of you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Everybody take one. We have fiction. This is going to be reviewed in the New York Times in July. This one is prize winning. Here's the UFL professor that I told you about, Nella Lerman in poetry. There he is. Hello. 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 Why, it's the Jeffrey. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Nice. Nice. Oops. They'll come up down. One word. Yes. One word. It's doing like that way or anyway. <laughs> Just to take a look. I have. Oh, that's it. That's good. I understand. To return the Yeah. It's going to be a little cool in here for some of you. You want to be cool down there. Okay. I am hot. You want to? I'm hot. I want to. But if you want to be cool. I can't wait for her to see <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be here for one more time, I know. Okay, I will have cows. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is Are these part of what's supposed to be? Okay, this one. Okay, take the seats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, have my has not got anyone. I just changed this because this is an Indian surname or Pakistan. Do you think these poets are famous? I remember. I know. Kathleen Ossip in China in the 1980s. That has more poets than readers. Yes. Bovine interest. My window in the morning, the first place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very significant. But I don't want significant to signifier. Okay. House. Cows from the house. <laughs> she also has one of the coolest names in existence. Kiki Petrosino. It's hard to live up to a name. Is that cool? information about them that has already been given to you but uh, and you've already met Sarah but here is Jeff Skinner uh, they're married to each other have been for a long time 30 years really Great. 30 years I've tried to calculate how many marriages I'd have to have to get to 30 years of marriage <laughs> you're not going to make it I <laughs> but um, Sarah and Jeff are both very accomplished poets, and they're very different kinds of poets, I think. And we are privileged to have them read to us today and then discuss their work in science and books. Yes? Yes. Okay. So, that's it? That's it. That's all I'm going to do. They, <laughs> they have all your, your right. bio information. Okay, I'm going to start because we do a lot of this in I'm okay. um, going to read four poems from The Cure. I hope that's okay. It's a 2003 book. Um, I, my next book, my fourth collection, is called Bad Daughter. And that's out um, this fall. I've already seen the cover. It's in galleys. Um, I just need a darn thing in my hands. Um, it was accepted for publication almost four years ago, so I've had a long wait. Um, so we're going to move chronologically, um, and then I'm going to end with a couple of um, uh, short
short pieces from a longer essay that I've written called Study and Perfect. Um, so let me just start with the, the cure. Interim. First poem in the book. Interim. She loves the subway caught between stations, a butcher fanning himself with a sports section, a child's chlorinated hair whirled in a tight nest. She wants that face-to-face -face with the stranger's boredom, flat and unsmiling. Or in the late afternoon, the pause for delicious heat draped over the city like a cashmere glove. She eavesdrops, tunes in housewives for their coping cliches, one day at a time, live and let live, like those dream steering wheels that float in your hands. Once. She kissed a stranger's iron sleeve merely to be outside, to feel his scent replace her own. With age, she thought, we know ourselves. Better, yes, our lives rising around us like a mirrored bowl. What she wants is a moment of unknowing. She wants to be a rose, pressed between the pages of someone else's story. Page 26. Um, this poem is called River Mild. I've heard this story multiple times. Um, this poem is based on a, a faculty canoe trip that we took <coughs> long ago, probably about 20 years ago, down the Blue River in Kentucky, um, the English department. I guess most of the English department, maybe not. Um, most of the people that we care to go canoe. That's right. Most of the people we care to go canoe, who are st we're still friends with, yes. Um, it was a great, fun day, and um, I wrote this afterwards, River Mild. Yesterday I found a bit of pleasure in the present, in sycamores kissing the river with one leaf, in their exposed roots and hidden pebbles. I believed in continuance as I sat in the boat which remembered me, and still does, though it hangs dry and upside down. I had forgotten how to steer, but it came to me, the J-stroke, out of the deep and through my paddle to the crook of thumb and forefinger. I floated under vines, over riffles and swells. I was measured by the angling shadow clock, the fox running along the bank clock, the clock of hunger and exhaustion. I passed cows in a chain, then their owner, his wife, son, I was measured found fit. My hand created a tiny wake. I could remove it and still grow old. Most, most of the time when I say that I wrote about a faculty canoe trip, people sort of laugh. Not that just sort of laugh, they laugh uproariously because they can't imagine a faculty getting along well enough to go on a canoe <laughs> trip. <laughs> many, in, in many English departments a faculty canoe trip would result in several drownings. <laughs> None of them accidental. We go as tenure books. So this is called Crossing Myself on page 50. Crossing Myself. Shyly at first, along with the street faithful, staring at a boy in his crushed bicycle, or in courtesy, a tidy one after grace and before I ate, a bit of restraint, quick release. Lately, I've tried it long and deep over the Jewish half of me, dubious, self-reliant, over the beckoning fingers of my lover and my embarrassed academic friends. For them, the forehead touch, for him, tap, two fingers, just above my sex. It is like sewing a three-foot stitch that fastens me down, a fly, but leaves my wings flailing. Still room to wriggle out, though it might mean damage. So when I'm all alone, humbled on the floor, without my glasses on, I double back to the left shoulder and fasten a pin there, then the right. I'm grateful he was half human. And at Gethsemane, pleaded for a little company before turning his Jewish face toward that last kiss.
Um, and the last poem I read in this book is the last poem in the book. Um, Lady in Love poem. And this has a story behind it as well, which is that Jeffrey has written many, many lovely love poems to me. Although he's graduated to his grandchildren now. I, know, I noticed that. <laughs> Yeah, I've written one in a while. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're so fun. You know, yeah, it's much fun. I know, it's <laughs> <That's laughs> used to it. Anyway, um, and I never could write a love poem to him. I, you know, sort of dark natured. Um, and uh, every time I sat down to write a love poem to him, it turned dark um, and grim. I didn't want it to go that way, it just sort of naturally went that way. But anyway, I did finally write this. This is the ultimate love poem, probably the only one I'll ever write. And um, it's got a lot of darkness in it. <laughs> Late evening love poem. Don't ask me to stop the dark slipping into this poem. I met you in the dark, line 23, under a Norway pine, night country. Lost my flashlight, pitch stuck to my bare feet and thighs. So sure I married a blonde, but your hair was black. In Fiji, it's a sin to touch a person's hair, but make him a lover, and the taboo disappears. When kissing, we shut our eyes. Inside, it's deep mahogany, licorice, black coffee, delicious. I was floating blind in a year-long bloom. You were a star in a lit world, and then you fell, a dark to benefit your poems. The saying goes, a man too good for the world is no good for his wife. Yiddish, of course it's Yiddish. We need the dark for seeing inside. I crashed into you and stars punctuated my eyelids. The experts call them phosphines. Scarlet fever will bring them on and delirium tremors. Some think their explanation for a saint's visions. Love's door is hinged with pain. My mother died. Her dying guided me to you. My favorite sound is insects in the dark, rubbing their thighs together. Your jeans and black silk jacket and shiny buckled belt. Black makes me thin, and you, hip. How I love the 40s hat that shades your eyes. I lost my flashlight and bumped into you. It was an accident, lucky accident, lucky dark. Thank you. Great Thank you. Great you. Great Thank you. Great you. Great Thank 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 you. Great these are the galleys, if you can see the um, typeface that they're using, I love it. Yeah. It's really it's bad. <laughs> and the cover was great, but I couldn't bring that in. Um, I was considered probably a bad daughter as I was growing up. I'm the eldest of five, five girls, and um, I chose not to take the responsibility of the the normal eldest child or girl, and, you know, help the other ones be raised. I was the rebel in the family. And of course I had a bad daughter as a child too, and <laughs> so it, you know, it goes on forever. Um, but that's sort of the theme that runs through the book. This is called, When We Were Good, We Were. When we were good, we were precise, mindful of our tools, spent more time sharpening and making the cut. Made wind chimes from sewing needles and laid the broken ones gently to rest in pillboxes. Without birds and their thread-like courses, trees, we believed, might float upwards. We tied little silk knots to measure our way, scoured the dirty parts with lemons and gardenia spray. When we were bad, we were extravagant, like cruise ships through a canal. We improvised, lied, crayoned all over each other. We lost knives or left them to rust, stepped on discarded needles and blamed someone else. Birds scolded from above as our dog went rolling, rolling, rolling in horseshit. 
It felt so good. So incredibly green. <laughs> that, I'm doing a trailer, um, a little short film for this book um, called Bad Daughter. And this is the poem that my filmmaker is going to be um, illustrating. Uh, I can't wait to see what it looks like. If you want to give me your email addresses, I'll send it to you when I get it. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, immortality. The baby is a drug, for she makes us hungry and delicious. Have you seen the uncles shake their faces like monkeys, lips floppy and moist, saliva flying? The eyes of the baby are lucky nickels in a row, but your age has you bound, your sadness a woolen sorrow. You are full of stirs and folds, whips and dark layers. How might you approach the baby? Not with desire, nor entitlement, or castle armaments of teeth. Make yourself small. The baby is an Alice in Wonderland door, tiny beneath the hedges. She is naked, skin like spun sugar, fingers pink fiddleheads. Remember when the names for little things weren't sickening? Touch that fantastic little foot. The baby is an implant, a fresh cutting, she will take, she will take you away. Um, this is called After Pindar. Um, I don't remember why I called it that, but it was, it was sort of a jazz riff on a name, and so that's what I did. I took my name and sort of did this little free association thing. Pindar was a Greek poet? The great ode writer, Pindaresque odes. Very old, yes. Old, old, old. Old, yes, old. Old, too. Old, too, yeah. You're very old. You're very old. Okay. After Pindar. Sarah of Seer, which is burning, and of Ra, eye that rises phoenix like each morning. Sarah, like Sarah Sen, or Sarah Kinos, eastern god of sunrise. Sarah of Seer, and of Ra, 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 who saw through with her golden eye and applauded. Sarah the queen, Sharatu, that is, she ruled, as in, you rule, dude, but not without fear. Sarah close to Zer, German for very, as in, exaggerated, and of, and of hurrah, or raw, <laughs> that is, tender, uncooked, thick-blooded, thin-skinned, a sound like Syrah, from the Italian che sera sera, though she dislikes inaction. Sarah, a toiler, a thinker, a queen in contemplation of unsightly things, such as the earth cast in shadow, or frost, or herself singed. That's a really hard poem to read. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sure I'm, I'm murdering the uh, pronunciation of some of those words, too. Um, this is called This or That, and then, and then I'll go on to the excerpts from the essays. I forgot to print out the last page, so I've got to do it this way. This or That. This is the finger too stiff to bend, and the infant's clutching fist. This the greasy bean before coffee. This is the S-curve, the tilt and jump. This is the light that will change, ungating cars like horses. First signal, then turn, remain in your seat. Caution, falling this, falling that. That man is not God, though he resembles a younger version. This postcard comes from Jamaica. That book, born on the internet, takes place in Cambrai. Easier to manage ghosts than real people in that dark. This chair we trust to comfort us, this spine we never consult. Slippery when wet, not a leg to stand on. That jiffy lube, once a white castle. This valley view overspread with sadness, the tang of acetone. This bundle bending the twig. 
that playground till the bow broke. This emergency your new life depends on. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to, to, for something entirely different. I have written a book, actually, called Study Imperfect, um, which is a collection of essays, maybe 13 essays, um, and all of them examine um, various elements of imperfection and perfection. Uh, for example, I have an essay called On Selfishness, and another essay on lying. Um, I've got one on sentimentality. Um, and then, sort of binding the whole book together um, are these little tiny mini essays um, on the ac actual word perfect and its many definitions. Um, and what you end up sort of observing in the book is that there really is no such thing, of course, as perfect. And, and I come at it from very many different angles, and I hope it gets published. I just started sending it out. Anyway, I'm going to just read two or three small passages from that, and I'll turn it over to Jeffrey. Perfect water. A tricolored flag from West Harbor to East Dock. Near stripe of amber, middle, aquamarine, finely black with touches of evergreen. So clear, so spotless this early in the season, too cold for human swimming. Presumably fished out, though every day a man wades out to seduce a small-mouthed bass. A dinghy, you know, that's a small boat, named Pesto zigzags through the water, zig, zag. The rower can't see behind where she is going. She steers towards Anderson's <coughs> buoy, avoids the deep, but not so shallow that stones gouge into the boat. Her oars give warning, clank, scrape, jerk, instead of the smooth glide forward. She marks her progress against the shore, past boat docks, sagging green cabins, and the ancient Trollhagen guesthouse. She's not even a little wet, but feels like she's taken a giant bath of paradox, a gem water rinse from scalp to toe. Her boat leaves a meandering wake of darker emer emerald trimmed with foam. The oars send out tiny whirlpools on both sides. Sometimes she stops to watch their retreat how they chase each other, then flatten, barely five feet out and blend into the current. The sound is hushed and delicious and makes her mouth water. It's tempting to take a drink, so she lowers her hand, holds it under until her fingers go numb. Next year, she'll arrive later in the summer when the water's temperate, better for swimming, but laced with bits of algae that slither across her ankles. So those were perfect. Its anchor drifts, catches in time, in some other immaculate place. This is called Perfect Conversation, and it's very short. I love you. I love you, too. <laughs> this is called Perfect Solution, and this is a true story. A toddler's pink and white striped dress with gauzy apron and purple ribbon tiebacks. A hand-me-down from her cousin, already well-worn, nevertheless worn every day, whether or not her mother would allow it. The dress had a name, Paulo, like Paolo, a close derivative of pillow, for she slept inside the dress, not needing a pillow. On the yoke, two oval strawberry stains and one long drip of indeterminate origin apron semi-detached in places where she stepped on it while attempting to rise from a sitting, sitting position. It was a slip of mother, like her mother's slip, a second skin without the hurting patches. She lifted the dress over her face and her stomach calmed. She lowered it and knew what to do next. Could you wear a pillow, a glow room, a blanket? The dress was her forest place without the scary journey. She listened to the dress and in time refused to wear anything else. In her parents' world, world, this was impossible. What would people think, that she was poor, unbeloved? They cajoled, distracted her with party shoes, firmly enforced timeouts when the battle grew intense, and still the child would not take off her dress. What is the perfect solution but a pair of disappointments, two less than perfects, 
a middle making, not throwing the dress away, not wearing it forever. What, said her father, if Paulo were a pet, like a parakeet or a fish? Would you crush it in your sleep? Wouldn't you want to pat, preserve, and keep it happy? She could have her dress, but only if she carried it in a brown paper bag. And so she did for five years, and then some. <laughs> and that is a true story, very cute. My little three-year-old going to, to nursery school with her favorite dress in a brown paper bag. That was her pet? That was her pet, yeah. And her pillow, and her wise man, and all of those things. Okay, one, one more, and then a really teeny one. Perfect sleep. I remember only one such sleep following my firstborn's delivery from C-section, by C-section. I was under the influence of morphine and a pure, thorough body exhaustion. The first course was upwards, a mix of things half heard, only partially understood, and so wrapped in imaginative ribbon. The rattle, rattle of a blood cart became a tree with spoons in place of leaves. A nurse became a lifeguard with layers of zinc on her nose. Her announcement over the intercom, the answer to all of those dream exams. I say upwards because so much sleep is depicted as falling. Mine was not so. The room, with all its detail, receded, and I rose with a slight toiling up, up, up into the sun, to the second course kind of plateau. This was new land, very flat, very white, a salt field or desert made of chalk. Patches of dream flew against the sun, a miniskirt, some costume jewelry, but they didn't engross me. When I was hungry, I ate coconut. When thirsty, I drank the milk. This went on for hours, this perfect sleep. I reached the end, my backstroke, the mind carving shoulder blades and wings in the sand. I stroked and coasted, sculled and skidded. Soon I began to wake down into the township, the atrium, the bed, then lower to a squalling sound. I found the baby's face in mine. Oh, there you are. And this is called Perfect Ending one sentence makes you want to begin again. So you can read along with me, and um, then if, if, if any of you want to ask me to read a poem from uh, Saltwater Amnesia, I'd be happy to do that too, or we can just rest with uh, Glaciology. Glaciology is a <coughs> it's kind of a two-character poem. There's the, the speaker of the poem, the narrator, and another character named John. And the relationship between them, although it seems like they're friends, uh, is not entirely clear. Mm. John is a glaciologist, someone who studies glaciers. And something happens to him, which is not exactly spelled out in the poem. <clears throat> Glaciology. John called and we met by the turtle fountain, dropped into woods and ran rapidly the leaf like a little half. Since we had been together in the womb, it was not always necessary to speak to know the other's thoughts. We ran for an hour and broke from shade at the railroad tracks, crossed and entered Blue Dog. Hungry, John ordered a thick Bible black bread, open-faced, egg on top, and over easy. I had the same. All right, John, I said, where have you been all these years? Well, he said, as a glaciologist, I have to be where the glaciers are. One project can last years and run right into the next if the glacier cooperates. 
Last fall, out at Sipple Dome, we measured the temperature of the ice stream by inserting thermistor strings into the boreholes and letting them freeze in. Then waited. We were after the deut deuterium content. But equilibration takes time. Waiting is everything, don't you think? No, I said not everything. It orders more coffee. Well, said John, you should perhaps spend some time in the cryosphere yourself so you know what the fuck you're talking about. John, I said, you're the glaciologist. Chill. I thought then that we may fight, that I would have to kill John or that he would kill me. Then the waitress came by, and I knew by the way he talked to her, he had heard my thoughts, and he paid and left. I know nations must pretend to be people. I know people can't be squeezed into healthy alliance. All earthly ice is hexagonal, the six-sided snowflake. I know every time I solve the earth, I leave my mind. Ice rivers flow slower at the bottom edges, faster and heavier in the center. Comes unbelief after unbelief, decadence. Near the melting point, the surface contains many dangling broken bonds which promote the existence of a liquid-like layer. I know this, though a little, and the low friction of many materials on ice, useful for Jurgen sled, skiing, and skating, sintering of snow, I leave my mind. John, I'm sorry your father died, and the other one died, the one you called father. Men are just fire. Someone left the light of intelligence on all night. It's not bright enough to threaten sleep. John, I'm sorry the earth melts away. The next day we met again and played pool in the afternoon. The high ceilings and air conditioning and white walls made the place breathe around the green felt. The balls like atoms clicked, and we drank beer with submerged shots of bushmills. We smoked cheroots with white plastic holders. Mario came in wanting to challenge anyone to trick shot Horace, and John said, sure, though I sent hard thoughts to him, which he somehow ignored. John lost, but everything was good humored, and we kept drinking. John, I asked him later when we were sitting alone, do you imagine a definable point to it all? Do you see anything outside the books we have read and discussed, digested, and excreted? Why are you being such a woman, John said, and we laughed and left that place for the Quonset hut which at the time was still serving ice cream. After pistachio cone, John looked out of the sea to leave this cart before us. You know I lost everything in that game, of course. What do you mean everything? He said, everything. Does that include Cindy, I asked. Yes, Cindy. Ice cream C is flowing east to west. The surface velocity near our boreholes was measured along two prof profiles using repeat GPS positioning. In stage three, hypothermia, major organs fail. Clinical death occurs. Because of decreased cellular activity, brain death takes longer. Then he came over to help me build a bridge or stairway over or down the drop off leading to the creek and the ridge back up. The slope was sheer and filled in with junk, cement, and rock, meant as a stay against erosion. But how to sink supports deep enough and angled in such a jumble? <clears throat> I said, John, come inside. Let's think about this. We took drinks to the upper room and laid the plans on the floor beneath the skylight. What if we cut all the bamboo growing on your north side, John said. Oh, I'm sorry. And latticed it through the debris, building up from what was given us. And then what I asked. Then we can use the iron from the giant statue of Lenin I bought in Prague to fashion stairs. My daughter, Laura, appeared suddenly, and honey, I said, we're busy right now. She was younger than her photograph, and I think a little in love. John smiled, and she vanished. I said, John, how can we almost be through with this life? John said, ice has a unique property called regulation, melting of ice under pressure, coupled with adjacent refreezing of meltwater at lower temperature, at lower pressure. This is the mechanism by which a loop of wire can be pulled slowly through an ice block without cutting the block in two. At work, I found a message from Cindy saying, I saw you with John and thought of us all in that other time, sincerely. I thought sincerely cold, though we had not spoken in years. As I worked through the day, I realized how many come to me, came to me, not in the realm of school or words, but beyond some region where everyone founders, and I thought, where is my place of help? Why do they not come 
to help me, and then ashamed that I was grown, and the boy returned, the boy who could never speak up, and so never got enough, the dead boy. The zone of ablation where glacial loss is greater than gain. I consider language mistreated these days, asked to explain itself, to justify at the same time it bears meaning, to own up to creation at the moment of use only, and that only that meaning anyone pours in, his alone, another to the receiver, and so on. Equality of isolation, the fully mirrored present, zone of wastage. Whereas the ability of math to model reality outside interpretation, among the moraine, often a sticky form of clay, till, called gumbo, may form spherical shapes, may roll around in the glacial stream, picking up rock, rocks then known as armored tin till ball, armored till ball. The unaccounted delight and the may take in itself. John said, I am shipping out of Manhattan a Swedish research, research freighter called the Bergeschulm. We're going deep this time below blue ice. I may not return. John was dropping books over the edge of the pier into water, shrugging its green shoulders at the jostle of tugs. Not much for recycling, are you, I said. Everything recycles if you're patient, John said, letting Marcuse's negations open its pages and attempt to fly before he let it go. It did not. At some time in the past, I thought, I must have made a mistake, and now I am living the wrong life. Were we born near this water, I said aloud, but by then I was back, feeding the dogs. John, you are from the sciences. I am from the humanities. But you are more humane, what we call a paradox. The spine of Long Island is Wisconsin already. And why are we tempted to kill each other? These waters, he said. And you, weren't you born first? Depends on what day, you ask mom. Her drift of mind, yes. It turns out not everything is possible in America. In Manhattan, maybe. Is it some kind of father thing? The suspicion of scheduled deaths will be worse. Our airplane broke through a two millimeter uh, snow bridge and fell into a crevasse. The recovery of the damaged plane took six weeks. One engine and two propellers needed replacement. The crevasse under the plane had been filled in before work started. The LC-130 was finally winched out of its precarious position. The big X on the image of Ice Stream D marks the place of the accident. We were talking about women on the balcony during break, or we were talking about language on the quay, its obstinacy, its plush folds, its undiscovered pockets, its dead ends. Big sun. A pelican came near, and John grabbed it by the neck and held it under his chair. It was struggling and biting with its long clacking beak. And John, I said, that thing is tremendously strong. You cannot take it home. It's likely to kill us on the drive. Books and women. We were always talking about books and women. Freezing to deaths, slow drift, stage three, childhood returns, widows, white shade, soft opening, mother, mother of the woman. Lord bless John's soul. Lord bless the weak. Lord bless the devil's roll. Lord bless the words I speak. Lord bless the great Atlantic. Lord bless shark. Lord bless a blue fanatic. Lord bless light and dark. Lord bless a woman's body. Lord bless father's eyes. Lord bless Cindy. Lord bless mortal lies. In his palm, a peanut-sized, blood-flaked, flecked pellet held out to me. What is it, John? Take. This is what they extracted from my right temporary world. A bullet? No. Too cold growing. A crystallization. They were unable to identify the source. Are you all right? OK. My judgment's off. When I sleep, the scar is visible. I leave my mind.
So I, I suppose we could talk if you want to talk about that, or, or I, I'll, if you want to hear a poem from uh, Saltwater Amnesia, or um, whatever you want to do. Do you have any questions on this poem or anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, my question has to do with the title of the text itself. Do we have to say it again? The title of the poem. Glaciology. Glaciology. Is it what? Glaciology. Yeah. Is it? Yes. Uh, could you talk? Why? It, why it's titled that? Yes. Well, um, John studies glaciers, right? John studies glaciers. He's the, mm -hmm. the character in, in the poem. But you're asking why I went there, right? Why I went to glaciers? And I think because I'm kind of contrary to begin with and defiant, and now that everybody's talking about global warming, mm -hmm. I wanted to write about the dangers of cold, I guess. I mean, that's one part of it. Another is that I like poems that try and partake of science, that try and bring in other kinds of knowledge. And so I did some research on glaciology, because I think it's an, it's an odd and interesting thing to do, to go to glaciers, to look at them, to study them, this inanimate thing that's so impressive and so dangerous in a way and so oddly remo removed from the human. I like that. And it is a kind of dangerous activity, it can be. So some of the sections of this are just lifted from reports of mm -hmm. glaciologists, glaciologist reports that I, you know, zooming around the internet, I found that I took them out. So it's a, it's a little bit of a collage. Um, uh, and there was, there was a kind of, there was a kind of unconscious uh, or intuitive choice part to it too. I don't mean to say that all of this is um, is intent is is consciously intentional. It's not the way my poetry works anyway. But I'm trying to explain in retrospect. Does that help at all? Yeah. It seems to serve you. as a good metaphor. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So from an eco-critical perspective, I have understood that you are one of those men of letters who want to work hand in hand with the men of science to preserve the planet. Yeah, I think that um, I, I read a lot of science books. I read a lot of lay science books, not you know, not the real yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the I don't have the science background, but I love to read books on physics and some biology books. Those because they um, they are as mysterious to me as the best poetry and the best spiritual. Life. I also read. But there's something so clean about science, at least in our dreams of science. In actuality, maybe it's not so. But, but I like that. I like the fact that um, there is, I also like, and can't believe that there is a language <coughs> called math that actually describes the universe. That makes me crazy. How do we do that? How does that, I don't understand how the species can come up with a language that actually works to describe the universe. So I'm very taken with science, and I would like, I would like poetry, at least my poetry, and I, I like poetry in general to, uh, to try and partake of what's happened in science in the 20th and 21st century. It's amazing what we've come to. Is that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. By you? Okay, right. you first. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I was interested in the relationship of the speaker here with John. And the second line says, since we had been together in the womb, human womb, the earth as a womb. Well, I don't say, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, some things I, I have to leave. Some things I don't understand. I don't truly understand that. It seems like John and the speaker might be brothers, might in fact be brothers. Twins. Or, yeah, or they twins, they might be twins. twins. Or they might be friends who are so close that they can't, that they begin to think they are brothers. But I wanted John and, I wanted John and the speaker to, to have these, to be these different poles, like the scientist and the man of letters, who in fact are two sides of Janus-like creature, two sides of one, one person in a way. And how, um, and also to ad address a kind of violence that seems to be, it seems to be the potential when those two kinds of things, those two bodies of knowledge come together. And so he talks, they talk of killing each other. 
when I wrote that line, I thought, where the hell does that come from? But it's turned out that it is somehow is part of the poem. It's, it's part of the whole thrust of it. But I wrote that, and I thought, that is so strange. Why would they not do that? And then I kind of understood. Ben, um, oh, I want to just say, yeah. uh, do you, are you then looking at the point as an instrument of some force that makes him write things that he has why he did yeah. Speak up, please, so we can yes. finish it. Yes. Speak up, please. Yeah. Uh, are you yeah. then looking at poetry and the poet then? as uh, somebody who is an instrument in the hands of some forces he may not be totally in control of. Forces that make him write about two brothers who want to kill one another and then he steps back to ask, but why should, it be, should this be so? Uh, is the point, are you the kind of poet who is not in control of his poetry, some force? Um. It is an interesting question. It's a profound question. I mean, I don't. I mean, you could write a book on that that very question. I think easily. So, you know, my answer is only going to be a small part from my point of view. But the short answer is yes. I think that there is, in some way that I don't understand, something comes through me when I write poetry that I have no, that I'm not in control of. Um, I get smarter when I write poetry. I get wiser. I get more inclusive. Um, I understand more. And then when I stop writing, I go back to the same old dumb Jeff that I usually am. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. But yeah, I, I, and I don't know what that is. It's, a, if you call it the unconscious, uh, they're all sort of whatever you choose, the divine uh, or the other part, the other part, you know, whatever. It's, yeah, it all, it all kind of refers to some immaterial source, it seems to me. And so it's, I mean, I don't know if there's any, if there would be profit in it for me to go do it further. I sort of don't want to know too much about it because I think poets and artists are superstitious in a way. And they don't want to look too, too hard at the box, you know, inside the box. They just want to, they just want to have the box, and keep it in their room, but don't mess around with it. It might go away. It might stop coming. That that voice that comes through me. I don't want that to happen. I don't know if that. And you, I'm, I'm sure that your answer to that question would be as good as mine. Yes? Yeah, um, an extension of the question that he asked. I mean, what was the poem originally before you edited it into 18 parts? Uh, was it longer? You know, there is uh, often the, the place where the, the artist is in control. Yes, you're right. The artist is most in control at the point of editing or the point of polish or the point of um, staring at the first draft mm. and seeing what parts. But even there, there is a, there is a strong element of intuition or um, some process that's not fully conscious. The further you get in the process, the more the analytic, <clears throat> the analytic part of the brain takes over. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's really, I'm, I'm thinking now that you asked that question, I'm trying to think what, what kind of form it was in. I tend to write poems in sections, especially in longer poems. I like somehow it feels to me like looking at a jewel and being able to turn it around and look at the facets. And each section is a facet because if you go to a different perspective and look at the same event or the same person, you're going to have a different view. So this seems a comfortable way. I've been doing this for years of writing these poems in sections. So to round out. So I probably did start as sections, but probably. And now that I think of it, I did have a lot more science in it. It just wasn't working. I the remember cutting a lot of science out. Yeah, do you? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, I, you're right. So I had a lot of science in there, because I, you know, I wanted to get that in. But the science had to be fully integrated with the dream of escape of the poem, and with the, the information and the, uh, the source material of, of the relationship between the characters. A related question would be these sections, then. How much time did it take? Because you kept on adding sections and editing. And this poem probably took um, a month to mm. complete, um, w working intensely. The, the draft part of it, 
um, I did in an intense burst of like three days. I no. sat down and I and I could feel, and this is it's always very anxiety producing where I have a long project or a long poem, and I'm in the, the center of it or at the beginning of it because I, you never know if it's going to work. So that three days, I, I you know I pushed and pushed and pushed myself, and I was coming out to get it finished, to get it all down. I knew that later I would fool around with it, but just to get it to the point where well now I feel it's complete at least in some sense. I pushed so probably three days for the first draft, probably a month to write to make the poem the shape it is now. And section 16, uh, which is so rhythmic, rhymed, yes. uh, comes out a little different from the others. Yeah, again, I don't know why I did that yeah. little rhymed blues or whatever the hell it is. Or, uh, you know, it's not blues exactly, it's just it's A, B, A, B. And, um, yeah, I, I was also thinking that the syllables were, are not equal, though. Syllables per line. I mean, you have four, four, six, six, then seven, three, seven, five. Uh, well, I mean, if it was exact, it would be terribly boring. You, know, you have to vary, you know, even rhymed and metered stuff, you got to vary a little bit or else, it, to my ear at least, it gets, it loses. It, it, it loses. might be the opposite also. I was just thinking the opposite too. The music, it, it might have been the opposite also. I mean, it's just, a, it, had it been uh, also perfectly matching the syllables, yes. it might have been the opposite too. Yeah, okay. Well. There is a, I mean, you can make a point, as, as a, a poet named Charles Bernstein does, who I don't like, but he um, uh, he will do kind of parodic versions of conventional mm. kinds of poems um, in order to, not sure why he does it, but <laughs> it's very experimental and, and um, uh, cutting edge, I don't get it. But that, that was not my in my mind for that section. Um, I, I thought that kind of traditional voice coming in at that point. You know, a lot of the things that an artist does, at least this artist and this writer, is for the sake of variation, is for the sake of not boring myself, is for the sake of saying, gee, I wonder if this would work. And that was kind of a, a silly idea. Let me, let me do some rhyme quatrains and see if that I could fit that in here. I'm always trying to fit everything I can into the poem, whether it's different kinds of language, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of voices, different kinds of conventional and received form. So that's part of it, too. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I just want to mention that we can also ask Sarah. That's okay. Yes. I'm enjoying this. I, have, I know, but I got a couple questions for you. So. Thank you. I have a general question for Sarah as well, and you as a couple. Oh, good. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, before publishing the poem or sending this, uh, to any publisher, like, do you uh, would you like to listen to the critic of each other? I mean, like, do you read each other's text before and analyzing them together? And the second question, what inspires you? Like, both. Like, what inspires you? Um, well, yeah, we're very blessed. Um, Jeffrey and I met at an artist colony in um, Colorado in Saratoga Springs, New York, and left there together. Married there in 1982, um, and so we have. We were both poets, um, and so from the very beginning, we had this relationship, and both the personal relationship and a poetry relationship. Um, I consider him my absolute best critic, and I don't know how you consider me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're both really tough with each other. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm less articulate than. And so I will say, no, 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 that just got to go. I hate it. She says, get that out. And I say, why? And she says, I don't know. Just get it out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's the first place we start when we share work. And uh, we can go back and forth with revisions. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful to have that in my life. Because um, you don't, most people don't. You have to have it, though. Yeah. You have to. I'm already booked now uh, on being a poet. Um, about, about writing poetry. It's, it's a kind of um, self-help memoir. It's odd. But anyway, part of it is to f one of the, the sections is find a poetry companion. And mm -hmm. I think all artists need feedback from somebody they trust. Mm -hmm. Because we can go off on our own tangent. And um, that's probably the difference between madness and art, isn't it? There's, there's no discipline to madness. You know, it comes from 
some of the same places. But I need somebody else to look at. I can't see them. And we're just lucky that we have somebody who lives in the same house. I'm sleeping with my editor. Um, yes, sir, I think you had your hand up and then you. What's this? But my first impression about this poem is that I think that the speaker and John are the same person, huh? speculating, you know, thinking and now, you know, as if sometimes we'd like to think as if we had a kind of a conversation inside us, right? And this conversation is between the mind as you leave it in, in the 18 part of the section number 18. And I think the common sense of a, a human being, so it's the man and science, the natural man, the common man and science. And you were having this kind of conversation between John and the speaker. Which leads me to the, to the second question about section 18, I leave my mind, which is a kind of, for me, as a clue for this you know, conversation between you know, mind, which, which, is, which represents science, and the speaker, which is a you know, uh, common man. Is it here? Yeah, it's, and it's an interesting slant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the word mind is so capacious and abstract, really when you get down to it. But generally, we do think of, we do associate the word mind with more with uh, the analytical parts with, uh, than we do. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of the heart as being uh, the opposite of the mind. Yes, but here is the mind, there's the heart. Because here, my, I think mind is science, because you're talking about science. And yeah, you could, uh, you could see it that way. So I leave my mind could be read. I mean, I don't know what that means. I just like that line. Um, I, I, I don't, you know, I would. It's a whole section. My yes. And this is the yeah. It's an important. It's an important line and an important idea, yeah. uh, and it does have to do with. Uh, the, I mean, the poem I think is is a part of discussion about um, where we live. Do we live? How, how much do we live in the mind? How much do we live in the, the world of the spirit or the emotions? And what is the relationship between those those things? And yeah, I, I think that if you leave your mind, you you are going outside the sort of Western model of, of thought or the scientific model. I think that, that reads well to me. Yeah, the way it works at the end, though, of course, it goes back to section two, where it says, I know every time I solve the earth, I leave my mind. So then the last section is, I've solved the earth. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> you both remind me of Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned in some of the first lines, Cindy. Who is the Cindy and why Cindy? Who's the who? Cindy. Cindy. Oh, Cindy. Yeah, because yeah, that reminds me of words. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah it's, it's, it's John's love. Mm. His first and only love. Mm -hmm. And um, it, this is partially based on a, on a student that I had, mm. actually. And his name is actually John. And he um, met this woman in my class named Cindy. And they were together for a while, and then after. They were students, they became friends. You ever had that experience? When, you know, I can't be friends with students while they're students, but when they leave the university or they leave my classes, I can be friends at that point. Mm -hmm. And we became friends, and um, he, he was head over. I'm, I'm explaining the, you know, the sort of biographical source of that. And maybe it's not clear enough in the poem itself, but, but in any case, um, Cindy, and he thought he had found his true love, and Cindy, John did. It didn't work out, and both of them um, went their ways. But there seemed to be, since Sarah and I had had them over many times together as a couple, there was a kind of um, uh, conflation in my mind of that romance with the idea of romance itself. And so maybe it's not clear, but. Cindy was also a student of mine, so you know that I can I can bring in the idea of teaching and of, of students and what they want from us and what we give them and and what we want and you know, and that's a whole section about you know, when am I going to get mine? You know, when when is going to somebody going to take care of me the way that I take care of students? You know, so that was handy. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, then how would you account for the airplane accident? And perhaps, you know, there is that idea of death 
which is closely related to uh, the skull which permeates the poem. Right? I mean, the poem is not, according to me, the poem is not about glaciology. Uh, it's perhaps more about life and death. Uh, and if I got it right, uh, stanza 17 or section 17, sorry, I mean, we can, we, we, there is this idea of death. Yes. And termination. Yes. I leave my mind, I quit my body. Yeah, and, you know, yeah there is. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and it fits in with that, that romance, which is also over within the story. And he gives up Cindy. Remember in the pool mm -hmm. game, he gives up Cindy. So there's a lot of this poem. You're right. I mean, that, you know, if you're talking to people, it makes me understand my own thing a little better. But I think the poem is about endings. It's about terminations. It's about what happens after death. And I always thought, in that 17th section, in his poem, a peanut-sized blood flake pellet, was a conversation with John after he was dead. Mm -hmm. That's and what I thought. But you know, to, to maintain this idea, if you like, I mean, stanza 16 is like a sermon. Uh, section 16. Sorry. It's like a sermon, oh God bless me. A prayer. A prayer, a death prayer, and you know, the, 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 the John and Cindy, the initials on Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> brings us to the idea of back to God. All right, God, mercy, I'm dying. I got that impression. Well, you're scaring me. <laughs> How much you read it? Wow, that's that's incredible. That's great. But the interesting thing that I joined that is then. I got some room for scholars. Isn't it? The interesting <laughs> thing that to join it to what you say is the third, just the third line of prayer. Lord bless the devil's woman. Uh, at least we would expect the Lord to curse the devil. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, uh, again, I'm not sure why that, that line is there. It's trying to, I mean, I, I, it's hard to explain. Um, the devil's role, I think, is important somehow. I think we need the devil. We must. <laughs> really? I mean, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure what. Yes. We want another question. My, my wife question is to <laughs> Yes, sir. And then, then ma'am. I want to ask the have you read his criticism or analysis for what happened in Bowen? And you can say it is not that what I mean. It is hard for any discussion. Uh, I mean, or you can say, no, I mean this, not that. Yeah. Uh, it happens, I mean, like this. You can read any criticism. Or well, someone else, I mean, start to criticize and analyze your poems. And maybe he will say something or interpret this poem in different way. It is not what you are going to say or what you have said. Right. So, I mean, is it open to, to, for discussion or just you have to say, no, I'll be upset, he has to say this? No, no, I think it's, it is open for discussion. And yeah. I think that, I think that um, as, I've, as I've said, a lot of you have had good comments that I hadn't thought of before about the poem. So the poem should be open for any yeah, discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know everything about it. When T.S. Eliot was asked about, about all of the cultural influences and historical references and the illusions in the wasteland and how he put them all together and how did he conceive of such a thing and he said, well, you know, I was I was really depressed during the time I wrote that poem. That's really, that's really what it's about. <laughs> One word. Uh, I gotta go. A question to Madame Sarah, Sarah Gorham. So the title of this book is The Cure and it happens to be the, the, the keyword that I usually put in a search engine to look for any uh, information. So I wouldn't miss the, the opportunity to ask you this question. Can you tell us about the healing power of your words? The healing power of what? Your, your, your words. words. The healing power of, of poetry. Oh, okay. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> there is a long section in the middle of the book, um, which I almost never read from because it's so difficult. Um, I was writing a sectional piece about our families recovering from alcoholism. And um, they there were um, lots of jumps in time and space and subject matter between one section and the other. And so um, I wanted to provide some background to it, um, just some down-to-earth facts. And so I wrote this, I wrote the backstory. I did that pure and simple on one page, and then I divided it up and I ran it in between the 
homes, but it looked really bizarre there, and it was it interrupted the flow of the sections. So I ended up running them across the bottom, just like a CNN banner, you know, or mm -hmm. on television. And so they play, even though they're not complete on each page, they play against the sections um, beautifully, I think, and they provide the background and get all of this sort of wrapped up in one package. And it, it is, uh, you know, writing, I, you know, writing this, this series of poems called The Family After it was a very healing process for me personally. Um, I've also had a lot of people come up to me um, after readings and say, oh, you know, I can't believe you were that honest. Um, and, and I'm so glad you said what you said because my family was going through it too. Um, so, you know, it served a, a double function at the very least. It's a taboo subject, and um, you know you realize that uh, when you read this stuff out loud. To people, uh, but it's still a taboo subject. Even after all, of the, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. The modern age. Yeah. yeah. So, um, may I ask you such a question? Uh, what makes a good poem? It's up to you, because the other day we were discussing <coughs> this topic, and it's interesting for me to know from your point of view, as you are not only perfect, tremendous poets, but, but critics as well, right? Mm -hmm. And Editor. some words from your future books about techniques on writing poems it will be very interesting for us as teachers, I believe. As you mentioned uh, feed, about feedback, yes, finding a person who may just tell um, opinion about your prayer, what else, if you, if you can, just highlight some. Well, the, the, um, the question of what makes a good poem is also very profound and, um, in the end, unanswerable kind of question, I think. And you go back to David Hume's essay on what's an expert, even previous to that, think about the, the various proposals that he gives about how, how art can be judged and, um, and there are arguments. Um, for my own purposes, I, I think that, uh, and you can answer this too, um, Sarah and I started this press, and we found out very quickly that we had to decide what kind of poem we liked and what kind of poem we thought was good, because you, you wanted to have each press, a press or a, a magazine has to have a point of view, it seems to me, an aesthetic. So we had an aesthetic, and we talked about it, and we looked at the choices that we made, and it turns out that we do have a strong and definable aesthetic. It's not to say that that's the only aesthetic out there, or that, that it's the best one, but it is ours, and we can argue for it. So I think that's what you need to do as a, as a poet or as a reader of poetry, is to develop an idea of, for you, what makes a really good poem. What elements does it have to have before you can say it's a really good poem? And it's nice to be able to articulate that. I think it's also good for students. And I may, you know, I'm not, um, not everybody thinks this way, but I, I teach writing poetry and I also teach more courses that are more about literature, I suppose. To me, it's all the same thing. Um, but I think it's good for my students to know that I have an aesthetic, that I like this, and I can tell you why I like this, and I don't like this, and I can tell you why I don't like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is after years of experience and writing and thinking, this is what I do, this is where I've come to. So I think everybody needs to, to do that and be able to defend your aesthetic, um, but, but in the end admit well, it's just one of many. It really is. I was just going to say, it really just starts with reading, um, a long life of reading poetry and um, developing your aesthetic. I mean, I didn't have one initially, or I had one, but it was terrible. Um, and if you read enough, you suddenly come to the place where you've decided what your aesthetic is. Let me ask you an easier question, though, along the same lines. What makes a bad poem? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, we've sir. talked about this with the class, I mean, with the group already. I just thought, you know, you might I'm not sure it. that's an easier question. No. <laughs> <laughs> so God knows you read enough of them when you teach creative writing. Uh, yeah, uh, well, a lot of bad poetry comes from conventional notions of what poetry is supposed to be. So you will find people using language or using ideas or using received um, conventional tropes uh, that they've heard and that they think poetry is supposed to be. For me, you know, I tell them, uh, we, 
we want what Paul Valery wanted in, in what he said about literature. He says poetry um, is what's alive. And um, that's okay. It's, it's not the it's not the exact quote. No, no, I'm forgetting what the exact quote either. is. But anyway, um, for me, I want to I want to be surprised by by people things things that people say in a poem. I want to be uh, startled by the honesty, by um, by the invention, by the innovation, um, humor. the humor, the um, the sound too. I mean, the sound has to be a big mm -hmm. part. The sound obviously is a big part of poetry. So I have to like the I like the, I have to like the music of the poem. So there's a lot of things, and, and a lot of bad poetry has stupid music. <laughs> If people, but you know, if you if you see, you see, it's a lot easier in music, isn't it? If you get somebody up on a stage who's tone deaf and say, sing a song, everybody goes, oh. But with poetry, it's harder to gauge. But for me, there's there is tone deaf poetry, and I read it and I go, nah, you know, stick with your day job. Don't don't try and write poetry. And yet there are very um, distinguished writers poetry. writing tone deaf poetry, like what? Robert Bly and right Sharon Rose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can get far, even if you can't. Write musical poetry, um, and doing other things. So there's no real rules about it. But um, bad poetry is poetry that, that um, doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. that, to make it the simplest kind of, that there's no surprise in it. I think one of the uh, the Greek philosophers, I think it's uh, Longinus, uh -huh. he was talking yeah. about on the sublime. Yes, and he said that the sublime is. The, the final results of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a text, a great text, and it should transform the reader from one state, one psychological system mm -hmm. to the other. Mm -hmm. So there are no certain rules to make good poetry and bad poetry. Right. As far as the poet can make this transformation from one psychological state into the other, and he can make the reader, you know, have certain illumination by the end of reading that poem. Yeah. So there are no certain rules. But the result of poetry should be that transformation. So this is I yeah, think. that's well said. And this is uh, closely associated with talent. Uh, for me, it's very difficult to write uh, a short poem without having that talent, that ability, you know, given by God. So very difficult otherwise, to find yes, too. otherwise the poetry is going to be artificial poetry. You know, yeah. most of of the people I think sitting here they tried at a certain age, you know, the beginning of teenage and when we were at the center and stuff like that to write poetry. We had our own attempts. But it was artificial poetry. Nobody can read it because we don't have this kind of, you know, ability. I have one of my friends, he used to to take uh, words that rhymes and make a list of them. And then after that, he starts to, <laughs> to write poems. It is very, you know, this is kind of a tense because he doesn't have this talent. So yeah. I think it's very, it's very it important to him is to have this talent, yes. Yeah, it's just funny, in, in my book also, I must say, um, I talk about talent. And I start the section off by talking about a colleague of mine who once said to me, I, I believe in talent. And it, it astonished me because I thought, well, of course, you, why would you have to believe in talent? Talent is a fact, like any other, like a chair in a room. It doesn't require belief. And that, that colleague was Tom Byers. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in my book, man. <laughs> uh, but I found that strange. I had just gotten to the academy, and I had I'd been in business, and I was not used to the way that you know uh, people in the academy talk in, in literature. And so he said, you know, I, I believe in talent. Because I kept talking about, oh, there's a talented student, I guess, or something. I don't know what the source of our conversation was. He said, yeah, I, I believe in talent. Like, yeah, I, I, you know, it's part of my belief system. I mean, talent is in there. I think, you know, it's something innate, something you were born with. I mean, uh, a football academy, a soccer academy, wouldn't produce Ronaldo's and uh, David Beckham's and but a street, you know, could produce the best Absolutely. soccer player. I mean, it's, it's, it's there or it's not there. You have it or you don't have it. I'm, I'm with you, and I, and I believe that. I think that it's it is more um, problematic in the literature, but but I still I believe that you know if you can talk about talent in basketball, there's no reason you can't talk about it in the literature. Yeah. It also comes and goes. I mean, I've seen that. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen that over the lifetime of a writer we published with Saraband that you know 
couldn't make it again. Right, there are writers, I can name a few, you know, who had very distinguished careers in their 20s, and then they kept writing, and they went into their late stages in the, at the age of 30. Uh, so they really, I would not like it that way. We have a couple of very famous poet who is wide read, you know, across the Arab uh, country. And in one interview I was uh, watching, uh, the reporter asked him about, he was accused of not knowing anything about classification, you know, scansion and stuff like this, and the different um, verses that appear in the Arabic poetry. And he said, it's not a tradition, it's a fact. I cannot name the different versification in the Arabic poetry, but if you go back and look at my poetry, you would see that I have used them all. Correct? <laughs> yes, it's right, because he doesn't know anything about versification, but if you go back, he's a brilliant poet. So he immediately ascribed that to talent. He said, I have only the ideas, and I start writing down the ways that come, pops up into my mind, and the result is poetry. And it's a very famous one, actually, one yeah. of them. And that does exist. I mean, you know, you, you, I, uh, we have found writers that um, have just a certain raw talent and none of the book knowledge, you know, yeah. that goes along with writers normally. Um, I can tell you something about why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> He's been thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, well, part of it is that I think that the notion of, of the genius who is separate from the rest of us is overrated. Not, I, I do believe in talent, but I, don't, I, th I think it's an overrated notion, partly because in my experience, the common denominator among successful writers, and, and I, I, there may be lots of other people who have this and I don't know it, but it's not, that, it's not necessarily any particular skill so much as it is the need to write. The people I know who aspire to be writers, the thing that separates the ones who become writers from the other ones is that the ones who become writers are the ones who need to write, and the others just want to be writers. You know? yeah. So part of, I mean, I, I think it's easy to overestimate the part of it that is sort of God-given and inspirational. I also know from writing poems myself that you know the poems are that poems are much better when you shut off your analytical mind or your need to say something in particular and let language happen. And I understand that. But but part of what I wanted to get at is is that is that you are not born a writer. You become a writer by writing. And, and you know it, it, there was a time in hippiedom when everybody walked around claiming to be a poet. Bullshit. You know, people who are poets are people who write poems. Among those people, there are bad ones and good ones. But if you don't write poems, you're not a poet. Yeah, that's true. And if you don't write a lot of poems, unless you are really mystically talented, which a few people are, you're going to be a bad poet. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with everything you say. I think that, uh, to boil that down, um, is. You might say that talent is not sufficient, right. and that is absolutely true. Right. I've known lots of talented people who've, who've quit writing, who've gotten off the track somehow or another. It, you're right; it's not sufficient. There's all kinds of other things, including the desire to write mm. or the need to write. For me, it's a it's an odd need. I, I get I actually get uncomfortable and physically um, begin to lose my moorings if I don't write for a while. Malaise. You get a malaise. Yeah, yeah. Right. And every successful writer that I know tells me that. That's the truth. Yeah. Well, that need for writing could be, you know, the talent, could be a glimpse, a certain, a certain way of declaring itself. You have great distinction between people who are writers and people who have this need to write. So, how come that you, you, you can tell that the need is a kind of a manifestation of the talent that are? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, what yeah. I would say about that is, is simply that... We don't have marks, sorry. We don't have marks for talent. So we have a mark on our that, that says yeah, that this man is talented. But it manifested itself, it showed itself in different ways. Right? 
this is my opinion. Part of the difference that I would make between mm -hmm. that is that when people talk about somebody being talented, it's a kind of pre-established gift. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the need to write, it may be there, it may be there at the beginning. But how you get to be a good writer is a lot, not because you have a pre-established gift, but because you have enough of a need to write, to do enough of it, to get good at it. Well, let me tell you another story that's, I mean, that's, that's right. And I'll tell you a story that I also included. Everything's in my book these days. I guess when you're in the middle of a book, you, you yeah. think of the whole thing. But um, I was talking, another little section on talent, I told the story of a rock promoter, the guy who promoted rock musicians and signed them to a label, I forget who it was, David Geffen or something, somebody like that. And he said something in an interview that stuck with me. He said, when I heard that group, and it was a major, major group, I heard them for the first time. I heard in their music the desire to be famous. And I think that's a little bit of what you're talking about. There has to be that is it's it's lots of musicians I know um, are very, very talented, but you don't hear that in there. You don't hear that desire to be famous in, in their in their or maybe they have a desire to be famous, but somehow you know they're not making the right kind of music. It's more complicated than that. But I think there is some something to that. Are you talking about ambition? Well, drive. Drive, drive yeah. And ambition, yeah. Drive. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I think that we often do underestimate the capacity of people to get better at things. Uh, you may Just not write something we, on the board while you discuss. Okay, we cannot all become a short sentence great basketball players or great writers, but most of us can get better at, at things that No, it's all over for you in basketball. Well, it's all over, <laughs> <laughs> it's all over for me in basketball, but I got better, you know. I, I, but the, um, uh, the big thing about this is drawing, which to me is a kind of mystical talent that people have, except that drawing teachers tell me they can teach almost anybody to draw. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and they poo poo the idea that the drawing has anything to do with art. Right. Real artists. Oh, anyway, yeah. I know. We had another poem. Perspiration, you know, correct? Perspiration. Perspiration. <laughs> Not transpiration. Yeah. Perspiration. 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 This is French. Yes. Correct. <laughs> this is perspiration. That is, that is English as well. Uh, really? Yeah. But the original is perspiration. That's, that's, that's what, it's not what a new linguist It's Thomas Edison. Huh? It's Thomas Edison. Borrowing. Sorry? Edison. Thomas yeah. Edison. Uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. I didn't know that. So, Thomas, can you just write it down so that Thomas I can know? Yes, Edison. but I should correct the code as well. <laughs> Uh, no, but I'm saying that we, we transpiration say is in English. Different ways. We say the genius okay, has 1% talent and 99% of uh, work. Yeah, 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 that's the same yeah. 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 Simple yeah. way, yeah. Mm. That's true, too. Uh, I got a question. That is, uh, which, which poet do you appreciate the most? Uh, uh, when you write, uh, writing poem, uh, which poet do you appreciate the most? When you write a writing poem, are you influenced by them? When you're writing a poem? Are you yes. influenced by the, the people that you like? Yes, the, people, uh, the poet you appreciate, and uh, when, when you writing poem, are you influenced by, by the poet you appreciate? Well, that, and there's no saying that the poet you appreciate the most is the other no. no. You've got to pick, you gotta pick no somebody. You go far away from that. Anyway. Not on the table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I can answer that question briefly, which is that when I was growing up in the poetry world, I, went, I did my master's in fine arts at Iowa, University of Iowa. Um, I studied with Louise Glick, and Louise Glick was my uh, hero. And it took me, gosh, seven or eight years to get out from underneath her influence on my work. Um, I wrote the same kind of poems that she wrote. Uh, they weren't bad poems, they were well published, but they weren't my poems. Um, and I eventually found my own voice and so on and so forth. Um, but more recently, I've been um, reading, I've been reading a lot of Ann Carson, who mixes um, poetry and prose in a really inventive and unpredictable way. And Thus, reading this, I became interested in the essay and stretching out my line longer. Um, not so much this really tight little uh, 
sonically limited um, piece, but but the long, the lengthy line, in the conversational line, um, and and the lyric essay, which is a cross between prose and poetry. Now another question is uh, for the new beginners of writing poem. Do you have any suggestions for a person uh, who wants mm -hmm. to learn to write a poem? Do you have any suggestions? Who wants to learn to write a poem? Yes. Clue is there, yeah. If you have a talent, you are going to all the best. Uh, if a person, he wants to write a poem, and yeah. do you have any suggestions? Yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know if it's appropriate, but teaching young children to write poetry, um, there are some wonderful exercises that Kenneth Koch, uh, that K-O-C-H, has written, um, I forget the titles of the books, but they're, um, they're exercises for children, and they start with, you know, imagine you are a piece of fruit. <laughs> sim simple, fun exercises like that that, can, that encourage uh, concrete language description and steer you away from the big, heavy subjects. Uh, so I think starting there would be great. And where can we find your book? Coach. Anywhere? Coach. Robert Kenneth Coke. Um, um, Ken, um, Kenneth Coke. What's, what's the famous book? Rose, where did you get that? Ready the second Yeah, book, but what's the first one? Uh, I can't remember. To buy this book. I mean, like, well, you can get it online. Online, online. Yeah. 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 But look, go, look for, I can't, we can't remember the title of Kenneth Coates. Kenneth Coates did a series of books on teaching people to write. He taught kids to write, he taught um, older people to write, and he had wonderful um, exercises. So if you look under Coke, he's also a poet, obviously, you'll find books of his poems, but look for the, like, Rose, where did you get that red, is one of his. Rose, where did you get that red? Mm -hmm. But it's book of the poems, and where he teaches how to write, it's yeah, name's different one, right? Okay. Yeah. The book Rose, where did you get that red, is a book about how to write poetry. Oh, okay. Yes, that's one of the titles that you, you okay, might thank look you. at. Yeah, it has actually some the examples, too, from the Rose. wonderful young people. No, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that... Um, uh, it is good to do um, exercises, to do, to uh, imitate older forms, um, particularly older forms in whatever your culture is. I think we need to, I needed to look at um, the whole line of English prosody. I really, I mean, I did it out of joy, but I needed to know it. I had to, when you, when you want to be a, a writer, you have to uh, digest the literature. You, have, you can't just read it, you got to make it part of your body. And that's why I can show you poems of mine where I can say, look at this line, that's a frost line, and I put my own words into his frame. I stole that, I stole that, that form from him. And I, I have a poem that I can, I can point to. It's almost that's the okay. exact thing. So, but I did it unconsciously because I had to stimulate it. Um, frost. But you want to do that, you want to imitate those people that you love. Um, the, the poet uh, Sylvia Plath, you all know who she is? Mm -hmm. yes. Sylvia Plath, before she wrote Ariel, her, her most bro one of the most brilliant books of the 20th century by far, she um, sat in the, in the back of her lecture halls in, in college writing Sistinas and Villanelles and Triolets and all kinds of form poetry. And you can see it in Ariel, that mastery of the formal parts of it. So whatever your, your tradition is, go back to you know, I would you know try and write whatever those those uh, conventional forms are, over and over again. You'll, you'll write a lot of bad ones, but that's okay. So, you know, I, so, I do. Uh, oh, the other thing is, I, I don't know if this would work or not, but um, whenever I'm in a slump and I have trouble uh, figuring out where to go next in my poetry, um, I'll take a short, simple poem that I love, so a poem that's full of detail um, and description and all of those concrete things, and I. Um, I put two columns. One is the original poem, and then I write the, the inverse, or the opposite of each line. And it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it forces your mind um, in a completely different direction than you would normally go um, by habit. Um, and it's very rote. You just write the exact opposite, and then you see the jumble mm. of words that you have um, and make it into a poem. 
Yeah, some of these exercises, some of the best exercises distract you from what you think poetry is supposed to be. Right. Another one that I love, this exercise, um, is I have my students, I'll give them a Swedish poem by Thomas Transformer in Swedish. Nobody knows Swedish. None of them know it. And I say, translate it, lay that into English. And they say, well, I have to look up Swedish. I said, no, just what it sounds like. <laughs> you take a poem from some language that you don't know, or, um, well, poem is best. Take a poem from a language you don't know and translate it into your language, just trying to get the sound of it to translate that's, that's over. That's hard. I found that exercise really hard. It's hard, but you come up with the wackiest lines and the most yeah. interesting, surprising things. I mean, you want to make them grammatically correct and syntactically right. Um, but sounding as close to the original as possible. But that's one. There's many exercises like that. Um, if I'd known, I would have brought in a, a, a list of books. Because I give my students a list of books. There is one book uh, called Poem into Poem by Alan Maley. That comes to my mind. Uh -huh. Is that good? <laughs> that, that, that is, that book, uh, that's uh, quite often used in India. Okay. Mm -hmm. Poem into Poem. By poem into Poem. poem. Into. Yeah. I will send Tom a list, and he'll send, he'll give you, for those interested, yeah. um, a list of, of books that I think are helpful to po po people trying to begin writing poetry and give you things to actually do. Yes, sir. One more question, please. Uh, you pay uh, tribute to Paul. Which one? Page 64 here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Homage to Paul. But you, the poem doesn't talk about Paul. Well, the, the, um, the poem itself is a kind of surrealist um, narrative about, you know, it starts, I cut my father into firewood. Mm. It's hard to take that literally. But uh, it's sort of taking Poe who, who wrote these wonderful, I was very influenced by his stories when I was a kid, I loved them. Um, so that sort of gothic danger and mystery and ghostly stuff, I kind of invert in this poem, and um, it, it feels to me like Poe, I think that's what I was getting at. You know, he burns up the father for, for the winter firewood, and then father's all gone, you know, he burned up all that wood, then what do you do? And there's something Poe like about it, but I don't know what the hell it was <laughs> anymore. <laughs> that was a weak, weak answer, but there you go. Yeah. Uh, and another question. It would seem to me when you spoke as though one can send his manuscript to more than one publishing house. Is that it's common practice? Submits their poems to more than one? Uh, if you have a collection of yeah. poems, is it common practice? That collection of poems to more than one piece yes. of yes. yes. It is. And, and publishers generally only want you to, if you get accepted by somewhere else, to let them know that the book is not out there anymore. It's not free. We're right. getting a whole lot of phone sounds. Can we, and so forth, is, is there, can we turn them off, whatever it is that's beeping? Oh, no. Well, I just heard another one. Um, Indeed. I hasten to add that you cannot do this with critical pieces. If you submit to more than mm. one place at a time and they find out, they won't read you, and they won't read you the next time either. Well, it's a lot more. It's a lot more. Um, uh, it's a lot more strict when you're submitting a poem or a group of poems to a magazine. Then you should not double submit or triple submit. But no. with, with manuscripts, you can do that. and it's different in the scholarly world. Right. right? It's, right. it's a different story. Yeah, and in the scholarly world, you can send out a book proposal to multiple right. publishers. Yeah. That's the but see, there's no such thing in poetry as a, as a book proposal. I know, but I'm just trying to tell people not to send I got you. critical stuff. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and one more comment. Of course, you know, this poetry book, you know, didn't make you rich. No, no, it didn't. <laughs> I mean, I was hoping. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow it didn't. All right. I you know, just want to rub it in? I mean, what you bring that up for? <laughs> we have these conversations all the time. Yeah, in jest. morning. Yeah. We talk about poetry and money. and you know. yeah. They're not very well acquainted, yeah. poetry and money. Yeah. Well, one thing that does happen with a lot of poets in this country who are, if they're really good, and the competition is fierce Unbelievable. for the for the jobs as tenured or tenurable professors. Mm -hmm. 
but there are a lot of poets who do get such jobs. And if you get such a job, you're getting paid something for writing your poems. That's true. Yeah. That's, That's part true. of what you do for the for the school. But I was on the search committee that hired Jeff, and it was scary to see what people had and they couldn't get tenure, tenure jobs. It's yeah. just it's worse now. Yeah, I know. I know. Terrible. I feel so sorry. For there's people. also there's also the the um, the consolations of, of Sarah and I, for example, have lived in Robert Frost's house for a period of time as mm -hmm. as writers and residents. We lived in James Merrill's house. For a period of time, I've been a um, an artist in residence in Ireland for a month. We we get to do interesting things that aren't exactly money, but they're mm -hmm. they're better. I mean, I have some lawyer friends, and they say you went to you know you lived in Robert Frost. That's cool. Yeah. And they make a lot more money than I do, but they don't do those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes right. Less so now that we have grandchildren. Huh? There are certain privileges. Yes, there are. Yeah. There are. Yeah. And I I treasure them. Where is Robert Frost's house? Well, Robert Frost lived in New England. He had a house. He had a couple houses in Vermont and and one in New Hampshire. And the one in New Hampshire was turned into a museum. You can go there oh. and visit his house where he wrote and lived. Mm -hmm. And they have also a, a poet residence during the summer months, and they'll choose one per year. But I have to tell you about this place. Okay. <laughs> we had our two children with us, and at this time they were about seven and nine, and they were up on the second floor playing. Um, Heavy metal music at top volume. In Robert Frost's In house. Robert Frost's house. I know <laughs> that he would not appreciate he was that. Turning over and then the turn. other thing is that there was no clear demarcation between the museum part and the private quarters of the resident poet. There was just a little sort of uh, velvet ribbon between, <laughs> between the, yes, and so I would come out of the shower and suddenly there would be some <laughs> museum. Or you'd be eating your breakfast and you'd look up and there'd be some museum taking pictures of the house <laughs> and the refrigerator. It was really uncomfortable. It was fun, though. Yeah. Other yeah. questions? Like prose poetry. I love prose poetry, yeah. yeah. What's the difference poetry. between prose poetry and lyric essay? Um, it's, a good it's a good question. Uh, I think that lyric essays take even more um, risk in form and structure than simply prose poem. Oh. What? I don't know. I said form and structure. So they don't do just blocks of prose like prose poems do. There, there will be um, lists or um, definitions or um, I have one of our books is called The Book of Beginnings and Endings. Um, it's a lyric essay. It's a collection of lyric essays. But they are the beginnings and the endings of invented texts from zoology, from astronomy, from all different criticism, and they're basically placed beginning, ending, beginning, ending, beginning, ending throughout the book with no middles. Um, so that's something you don't do in prose, book, um, in prose poems. Um, so that's what I would say in long and short. Most often than not, the length also has got to do something with it. Yeah, but there are lyric essays. Yeah, we're, we're publishing another book that is basically big fat prose poems, you know, um, mm -hmm. except the difference is that there are linkages within each poem so that there's a thread running through the whole collection. Uh, and you don't see that very often. So well, you see that a lot. That is, the, that is the current mode. Oh, it's the current mode because yeah. it's the lyric essay. All right. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of, of mixing of genres going on right now, a lot of hybridization. Mm -hmm. And the definitions are becoming less and less clear. Sound familiar? <laughs> Have you talked about that? Well, there's just a hybridization of all kinds going on yeah, all, all over is. this seminar. But uh, I do, I can give you a firm definition for the difference between fiction and creative nonfiction. Can you? Yes, I can. Well, tell ready? us. Yeah, tell us. Creative nonfiction is your resume. Fiction is a letter of recommendation. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. That is good. Oh, God. Other questions? None of which is very creative. <laughs> oh, yes, that's not true. Yes? Uh, I just remarked that in this collection there are just about two dedications. The one to um, Sue Allen Strutt and the one to Anne Byers. 
uh, you don't seem to dedicate very much to people, but uh, why this particular to um, Mr. Bayer, Tom? Yes, yes, uh, elegy, the elegy um, with, the little, with the yellow boat is um, an elegy to Tom's first wife, Ann Byers, um, who was a good friend of ours and who we vacationed with, and that the poem uses as its uh, background the vacation that we had. And uh, I very much love Dan and Eric with everybody who knew it. Um, so are you asking why that poem was dedicated or not other? I just found that it was a rarity for you to get quite to person that's two that's 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 Yeah. Some people dedicate a lot of their poems and I think it gets a, it loses a little power if you, you know, every poem you write you dedicate to your this is for my mailman, you know, this is for the guy who changes my pool water, you know. <laughs> uh, but those two dedications in, in my book are, and they really count for me. What was the second one? <laughs> <laughs> what was the other one? Sue Ellen Stewart. Sue Ellen Stewart. Oh, well, they were, they were people, um, they were, it's a, Sue Ellen and, and Stewart were a couple that we met while living in the James Merrill House in Connecticut. And they took us out on their boat and they befriended us. And she's actually a poet. And, and the poem has to do with their boat and the relationship with them. So that's why I mean, that, that dedication is sort of dictated by the circumstance also. I still get letters from people who read the Ann Byers poem. I got one recently. To somebody, you know, wrote it many years ago, and published it. Well, people people respond to to things of the heart. They just do. Why not? Even in poetry, even in the you know the sort of dry intellectual world, it's sort of poetry. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so why don't we thank Jeff and Sarah. <laughs> and if you want to get your book signed, come on up. <laughs> yes. Do you think that the wine and the food are important to you?